Victoria and I'm the president of the Science and Environmental Club. So on behalf of my board and I would like to welcome you to our presentation. And so Dr. Holt is a very accomplished woman who has many years of experience in the science field. She's a member of the Climate Project and currently writing children's books about our planet. She was a scientist at GPL for 25 years, focusing on NASA's space shuttle Earth observing missions. Her experience training astronauts to observe and photograph the Earth for these missions sparked an interest in her to teach students about our planet. In 1995, Dr. Holt created KidSat, a shuttle-based Earth imaging camera that used NASA's communications and the internet to allow students in their classrooms to operate the camera during a mission. In 1976, she re received her Bachelor's of Science at Berkeley, and in 1981, earned her PhD from Caltech. Since then, she's written eight literary and technical books, 45 magazines um, and journal articles, and over 100 conference papers. Her awards include Best Travel Guide for Children, Silver Snoopy Award for NASA Man Flight Awareness, and FedNet Webby Award for KidSat. So join me today in welcoming our accomplished and wonderful speaker, Dr. Woods. So you heard that I did some things with the shuttle. How many saw the shuttle fly over your school last week? How cool was that? that was cool. Well, thank you for having me here today. I've been talking to Victoria a little bit, and it sounds like a lot of you are already doing a lot of things related to the environment, um, which I applaud and hope that you continue doing it. Today, um, I've been asked by Mrs. Powers to come in and talk to you about climate change. And so um, that's what I'm going to do. Um, one of the things that I did at NASA was spend a lot of time up in the forests of Alaska understanding how their seasonal cycles work and how that relates to the whole climate cycle and carbon cycle using satellites, of course, since it's NASA. So um, I spent a lot of time doing that um, and hope that I can pass on some of NASA's latest results to you and in the end show you how what you can do relate directly to what the data says about our planet. So today we're going to talk about global warming and climate change and greenhouse gases and you probably hear them all mixed up together. So we'll kind of pull those apart and make sure you understand exactly what they are. What is the science and then what can you do? So we have to start with the atmosphere. Uh, on our planet, the atmosphere is really very thin. If you had a soccer ball, paint on the th soccer ball would be about as thick relative to that ball as the atmosphere is to our planet. So we're talking about a very, very thin part of our atmosphere. We know it's made up of oxygen and nitrogen. Whoops, my blinker's really going crazy. Okay. Made up primarily of oxygen and nitrogen. We breathe in the oxygen. We breathe out the CO2, the trees breathe in the CO2, and breathe out oxygen. So we know that oxygen is really important. We also know that CO2 is a really important part of our planet's atmosphere, very important for our life. Um, although carbon dioxide only exists in very small quantities in our atmosphere, it's still very critical. Relative to our whole planet and our climate, the main reason CO2 is so important is related to the same reason that your car gets hot on a hot day inside. The sun, in our, the sun shines down on our planet and goes through the atmosphere. Not much in the atmosphere blocks the sun, sun's rays from coming down to the surface. We know that because we can look up and see the sun and all those visible rays come down through the atmosphere to our surface. They heat the surface. And then that heat turns into a different kind of energy um, and is radiated as infrared energy back. And if we had no atmosphere, that's what would happen. The sun's rays would come down as visible light and be radiated back out in the infrared. But we do have an atmosphere, and some things in the atmosphere, primarily CO2, um, block that uh, thermal energy from going back out to space. So the more CO2 we put in our atmosphere, the more that heat energy is blocked and warms our planet. And we've had the same amount of CO2 for a really long time, for all the time civilization has been developing. And so 
temperatures of our planet have been relatively stable. If we had the amount of CO2 that Venus has, our planet would be 700 degrees temperature. Uh, so we know that we know very well this interaction between visible energy, infrared energy, and CO2 in the atmosphere. Back in 1958, a guy named Charles Keeling decided he was going to measure the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So he put together a little experimental package and tied it to the end of a balloon and released that balloon very frequently from Mauna Loa, Hawaii and made actual measurements of CO2 in our atmosphere. And this is what some of his early data looked like. So you two, see two things happening here. One is you see this up and down. This is one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. That up and down is easily explained by the way the vegetation is laid out on our planet. In the northern hemisphere, most of the forests exist, um, especially compared to the southern hemisphere. The equator is right about here. So you can see most of the vegetation is in the northern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, summer, when trees are growing, putting on leaves, adding layers to their trunks, CO2 is being taken in out of the atmosphere. Then in the winter, uh, when leaves are rotting and trees are no longer growing, um, CO2 is released and definitely not decreased. So the northern hemisphere is dominating this cycle. <coughs> And so in the summer, CO2 is taken in by the trees in the northern hemisphere. In the winter, CO2 is released. Again, in the summer, it's taken in. And in the winter, it's released. You also see a long-term trend. This is only about 10 years of data, so it was too early to get too excited about it. But if we look at that data since 1958, the data has been continuously collected since then and we see a longer term trend. Here's 1958 up until the present, um, and you see that over this period of time, CO2 is rising. So on this part of the curve, we have carbon dioxide in parts per million. That means number of CO2 molecules per million of other atmospheric molecules over a period of about 60 years. And over time, slowly that CO2 is rising. Well, you might say, okay, that's not very much, or maybe it's going to go down, or doesn't it go up and down over a lot of years, or you know, I don't really think that this is something significant. So scientists were able to um, look at CO2 in the past by drilling into glaciers in Antarctica and Greenland. So they drill these really long cores of ice. So a glacier, remember, is something where it snows, and then it doesn't freeze up in the winter, so that snow stays there. And then next year it snows again and adds a layer on top of that snow. And next year it snows again, so you're compacting to build your glacier all these layers and layers of snow. And trapped in that snow are little, little bubbles of atmosphere. And in those little bubbles of atmosphere, you can actually, or scientists can, actually measure how much CO2 there was at the time that snow, was, that snow fell. So scientists drill these very long cores that go back in time, and they can pull out measurements of CO2 from these. And from these, we can, this is our Mauna Loa data. So we're going to use the same vertical scale and we're going to expand our years and go back a thousand years. So here's the Mauna Loa data, and here's going back in time a thousand years. So back a thousand years ago, up until um, a couple hundred years ago, CO2 was pretty stable in the atmosphere. And in more recent times, it started to rise. Anybody know what happened around this time? You guys are good. Okay. Now you might say, okay, that's not very far back in time, but so with some of these ice cores, you can go back oops, um, thousands of years. So now, instead of going back a thousand years, we're going to go back 
400,000 years. So we've got Keeling's data here, we've got the early ice core data here, and this is ice core data for the last 400,000 years. So you see, first of all, these ups and downs in CO2 are related to the orbit of the Earth changes slightly. Its uh, ellipticity changes, the tilt of its orbit changes just a little bit, which it changes the exposure to the sun a little bit, and changes the heating to the planet a little bit. These are called Milankovitch cycles, and they make the CO2 and the temperature of our planet go up and down, creating, what are these called? Ice ages, exactly. And for a while we were kind of at the top of one of these ice ages, and then we had the Industrial Revolution, which kept us from falling back into an ice age. And um, you can see that where we are now with CO2 is very different from anywhere we've been in the last 400,000 years. So this isn't just a fluke, it isn't just uh, the fact that CO2 goes up and down over time, and uh, this is just another up and down. What we're seeing in the data is something very different than anything we've seen far into the past. So where does all this extra CO2 come from? <clears throat> uh, way back before the time of the dinosaurs, the planet, the, the continents were in a totally different location, the climate was very different, and there were a lot of these giant swamp forests. And these giant swamp forests died and were buried and over time turned into coal. That's where our coal comes from. Also, during the early days of the dinosaurs, the oceans were filled with these little diatoms, which are actually very pretty to look at. They died and were buried and over time turned into oil. So all this carbon stored in coal and oil remained buried under the ground for two, three, million, 300 million years until we invented cars and power plants and had a need for it to uh, get our energy and started digging it up and now we burn it and it turns into CO2. So here's the equation, coal and oil, which is carbon and hydrogen, plus oxygen, plus some kind of yield, or sorry, yields, heat, plus water, plus CO2. And what we want out of that burning is heat. We use that heat to boil water, to turn turbines, to run our power plants. Uh, we use that heat to turn things in our car that make our cars run. We use that heat in our houses to warm our houses. Many, many reasons that we burn this fossil fuel in order to get energy. But it all comes from this coal and oil that was buried hundreds of millions of years ago. Has anybody ever seen a coal train? Yeah. We were standing by the tracks in Nebraska one day, not looking for coal trains, and all of a sudden this train came by, and we counted cars, because that's what you do, and there were like 150 cars on this train, and they were all full of coal. And we thought, whoa, that's a lot of cars, and that's a lot of coal. But then seven minutes later, another one came by. And seven minutes later, another one came by. So there's like a pipeline from Wyoming, where a lot of this coal is dug up, to the power plants across our country um, to provide the electricity and energy that we need. The other way that CO2 gets into our atmosphere is by burning or Taking down, taking down and burning, or cutting and letting rot forests. Um, down in the Amazon is what, where we always hear about it. This is a picture from the Amazon where a, a big region is being burned. A lot of that is being done for agriculture, for cattle, um, and for agriculture to provide biofuels, actually to run cars. If you you can, you can see yourself how much this has changed by going on Google Earth and looking for Rondonia, Brazil. And you'll see something that looks kind of like this if you zoom in. And if you turn on this little clock here, you can go back in time and see what the forest looked like 10, 20 years ago. And watch those forests over time being cut down. So you yourself can appreciate 
how much of that forest is being cut over how much time, rather than hearing somebody say, oh, well, 10 football fields are taken out every day, or five states of New Jersey are taken out every year, go and look for yourself and see um, how much of this forest is being taken out. And as that forest is being taken away, all the carbon that's in those trees is either immediately or eventually getting into the atmosphere as a contribution to the CO2. Okay, so over time, we see that CO2 is increasing. We talked earlier that if you put CO2 in the atmosphere, it keeps our atmosphere a nice comfortable temperature, and if you put more CO2 into the atmosphere, our temperatures should rise. So are they rising? Well, we kind of know last week it was pretty hot, right? So does that mean there's global warming because it was really hot last week? No. Did the station fire mean that there's global warming? Not really. But it turns out NASA has a whole lot of satellites up in space. These are the ones that are up there now. And almost all of them measure atmospheric temperature either as a direct measurement because that's what they were sent up to do or because it's so easy they do it anyway. So we have a ton of measurements of the atmosphere. We also had weather stations all over the planet that have been there for decades and decades. So we know a whole lot about temperature. And there are lots of ways to plot that temperature. This is just one way. So this is the whole planet and it's for July 2011 and it's the the color tells you how many degrees above some normal temperature it is in any location. So they took as a normal temperature 1951 to 1980 and if it's really red then it was a whole lot warmer than that average period and if it's blue then it was cooler. So a couple things to notice about this First of all, the whole entire planet is not getting warmer all the time at every instant. Some parts are getting warmer, some parts are getting cooler. Um, but overall, there's a lot more red than blue. Also, there's a lot more red in the high latitudes, in the South Pole and the North Pole. And actually, this was a period when it wasn't so bad for us. 2011 wasn't as bad as some of the rest of the country. Another way you can plot this is to gather up all the data for all, all the world and plot it as a function of time. And here it's plotted from 1880 where it's mostly, well obviously there weren't any satellites then, so it's ground stations. And it's plotted up to the present. And again, they're, they're, doing, they're showing a difference from some average. So if it's rising, it's a lot hotter than an average temperature over some period of time. Anyway, what we see is that, yes indeed, the temperature is rising. Now you also see a lot of this. Temperature is related to weather. We know weather has El Ninos, it has storms, it has hot days and cool days, so weather is a lot noisier data set than CO2. But over time, it's clear that the temperatures are indeed rising. So if temperatures are rising, one of the places that's going to feel it the most is where there's ice. And one of the places, oops, we have a lot of ice, is in the Arctic. This is the North Pole, the Arctic Ocean. Here's Greenland. So we have ice on top of Greenland, and here's ice on top of the ocean in the Arctic, the, the North Polar Ice Sheet. And this is what the ice looked like in 1979. It's actually pretty representative of how ice usually looked for quite a few years. But more recently, um, this is this year's ice. It's always measured in September. Well, it's measured all the time, but the comparisons are done for September when the ice reaches a minimum. And so year to year, you compare just September data sets because Annually, that ice grows and shrinks. But uh, if you compare year to year, you have a valid comparison. So we'll go back and look at 1979 <coughs> compared to the current 2012. It's 
about 40% down from what it normally is. Also in thickness, it's about 40% thinner than what it usually is. This is a plot of the total area of the Arctic ice over a long period of time. So I wanted to make sure you see that the two days that I showed you are not our, our representative days or months from what's happening over a long period of time. And the Arctic ice is way up there and maybe the polar bears care, but it turns out we also care because the, the Arctic ice acts kind of like an air conditioner for our planet. When the sun shines down on the ice, it reflects off the bright ice, whereas if it shines down on the ocean, it's absorbed and warms the ocean. So the less ice, the less sun is reflected, the less cooling for our planet, and the warmer the ocean gets. So the more ice that melts, the worse it is for the ice that's left. We haven't reached this stage yet, but I hope we don't. Okay, the Arctic Ocean is, is an interesting place. Has anybody ever been up there? <clears throat> the fact that it's melting is going to create all kinds of interesting things for you guys to do when you grow up. Um, first of all, very just this last week, uh, there was an article that the that melt up in the Arctic blew away all previous records. What does this mean for the development of the Arctic? Now you have, instead of ice there all year, or right next to the shore, or most of the year, now you have uh, ocean. So remember the old stories of trying to find a northwest passage for ships? That's not so hard to do anymore. It also means that drilling for oil is much easier to happen offshore there. And now oil companies are already up there setting up drilling in the ocean. They, they kind of got snookered this year by the ice. It also means that um, life is a lot rougher for the polar bears. There was an article last week about um, some, a starving female polar bear who was challenging a male for a seal that he had just killed. So the Arctic matters to us. It also matters that, in general, our, our uh, land is getting warmer because it is creating more droughts. And those droughts are making it harder for the trees to survive and also making it easier for forests to happen. So even though you can't blame one fire on global warming, you certainly can't blame the fact that we're having more fires than ever before and they're harder to fight than ever before on the fact that temperatures are indeed rising. So we've looked at some data and some physics. We've looked at CO2 increasing over time as measured in the ice cores and by balloons. Um, we've looked at physics of uh, CO2 helping to keep our planet warm. We've looked at the temperatures rising because of the rising CO2. And we've looked at the ice melting. So. What do we do about it? That's the question. What do we do to stop this rising, CO, rising carbon, rising CO2 that we are putting in the atmosphere primarily through burning fossil fuels? <clears throat> and let's look again at where that comes from. The oil comes from the ground, we burn it to run our cars, and CO2 is released. Gas um, comes from the ground, and we put it in our houses, natural gas, and burn it to make heat. Um, coal comes from the ground, we put it in coal-fired power plants and burn it to make electricity to power our homes, also electricity to power factories to make stuff, and then we also, of course, put the, the oil in the trucks to bring the stuff to you. So at the end here is us. We got the cars, we got the stuff, we got the electricity, we got the heat. All that's coming from burning these fossil fuels. So if we start to look at how we might reduce this rising curve of carbon, 
We have to look at passenger vehicles. We have to look at home electricity and heat. We have to look at factory electricity and transport vehicles and also renewables. It turns out you guys control a lot of that. You probably know that in general, but let's look specifically at how you control that. First, home electricity and, and heat. Okay, you've heard about changing a light bulb, right? Change a light bulb, you'll save the planet. Well, how much? Um, you can do the math yourself. You take an incandescent bulb, and how much is it going to cost to get light for 10,000 hours? Uh, first of all, you're going to need 10 of them, so you're going to have to buy 10 of them, so that's going to cost you $10. Your cost in electricity is going to be $60 to burn that light bulb for 10,000 hours. And so the cost to get 10,000 hours out of an incandescent bulb, which is what a lot of you have if you haven't changed your light bulbs, is going to be $70. If instead you switch to a fluorescent bulb, you only need one of them, so it's only going to cost you $5. And your cost in electricity is going to be only 15, which is a whole lot less than 60. And so it's only going to cost you 20 bucks. So for every light bulb, every single light bulb that you change in your house, you get 50 bucks. Or your mom gets 50 bucks, or your dad gets 50 bucks. Plus you save 600 pounds of CO2 from going into the atmosphere. So that's one of those things you can do where you do it once and then you don't have to think about it. It's not like turning off the light where you have to remember every time, which is really hard. Do it once and you've saved a lot of money and you've saved a lot of carbon from going into the atmosphere. What if we all changed our bulbs? This is a picture of the Earth, or uh, our continents, at night. And you can see the East Coast is very brightly lit up. Our area is very brightly lit up. Uh, some of the bigger cities in South America are brightly lit up. What if we started changing all the light bulbs? And in fact, I think LA has a law lurking around where um, everybody's going to have to change the light bulb. So those are good things. The thermometer, the thermostat in your classroom. How many of you have a classroom like this in summertime? Sometimes, huh? How many have a classroom like this in wintertime? Sometimes. So it's not that hard to ask your teacher to crank it down or crank it up yourself or go home and when you're wearing a sweater in winter because the air conditioner is cranked up. You know, make a change. Those are easy changes to make. And they relate directly back to that fossil fuel that's being burned. All right, this is your shower. Your shower is connected to a water heater. So when you take a shower, you use two things. You use water and you use heat or energy. In California, our water, we're here, our water comes from way up here in Northern California or way over here in the Colorado River or way up here near Mono Lake. And not only that, but we have to pump it over the mountains. So the water that you use in your house takes a lot of energy to get it to you. And then it takes a lot of energy to heat it. So, what do you think about five minute showers? <laughs> really hard. Five minutes. five minutes is pretty hard, but challenge yourself. What if you cut your shower in half? How many of you go home and say, I'm so exhausted, I'm just going to go stand in the shower for an hour? That's a lot of water and a lot of energy. Think of something else to do to calm your nerves. Okay, um, now let's tackle factory electricity and transportation fuel. So we're talking about we're burning oil in trucks to bring stuff to us. We're talking about coal it's burned in power plants to run factories to make stuff to bring it to us. And we're going to pick on the water bottle. Okay, when I was a kid, we didn't have cup holders or anything like that. And so when we were done with our then glass bottle, we'd throw them out the window. Seriously, we did that. 
And so as I was a teenager, the big thing we had to learn was don't be a litter bug. That was our big awakening, that it wasn't so nice to litter the sides of the roads with cans and bottles. And they were, and now they're not. So that was the big change. Um, more recently, we think, oh, but all these water bottles, they're making our landfills ugly because they're filled with plastic water bottles that will never decompose. So instead, we put them in the recycling bin. And then the problem is solved, right? No. No. The problem with the water bottle is not at the end of throwing it away. It's way back at the end of making it. First of all, you've got to dig the oil out to make the plastic. That takes a factory. Then you've got to take the plastic and make the bottle. That takes another factory. And then you've got to drive, fill, fill the bottle and then drive that to the store, and that takes transportation fuel. And finally, you get your bottle, which you enjoy for, what, five minutes? And then you throw it away, right? So it's not so much the throwing away that's the problem, it's the energy back to make the bottle in the first place that is causing much more trouble than making our landfills ugly. So if instead you have a reusable bottle, you do have to make it once, but you're only using that energy one time to make it. Okay. All right. Now, think of all the other things that might be like that in your life. What about backpacks? Does everybody absolutely need a brand new backpack every single year? Do you absolutely need brand new bikers every single year? Think about it. Think about when you buy something, do you really need that? Do you really need six shades, five shades of almost the same color of lipstick? Because somewhere back there, fossil fuels are burned, and energy is spent, and CO2 is released in making all those things. Now, who controls who buys stuff? You guys do. So you have a lot of power here. There, I, I hear you guys have iPads. No? Laptops? Okay, laptops. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of websites that I think are really interesting. One is called thestoryofstuff.com or .org, either one. And it talks about, they have, she's got a couple of different things, a, uh, a woman named Annie. And she talks about stuff. Uh, in particular, in order to make a pound of stuff, like lipstick or backpacks, or water bottles, it takes 70 pounds of stuff that you never see that get thrown away in the process. And of all the stuff that we buy, about 90% of it is thrown away within a few months. Think about that. Is that true in your life? So she talks about this whole process, and it's a great little um, online video that you can watch. <clears throat> Okay, stuff. There's something that we buy that we need. We need, we need food, right? You can't uh, decide not to eat. But you can think about food. Let's think about, let's compare apples to apples. An apple that came from um, the Central Valley of California probably traveled a couple hundred miles to get to you. An apple that came from New Zealand, because it isn't apple season anymore, traveled many, many thousands of miles to get to you. and probably doesn't even taste that good. So as you're thinking about what fruit you're going to buy, think about whether it's in season. It'll probably taste better if it is, and it's a lot smaller carbon footprint if it is in season. Let's compare apples and applesauce. Okay, you're getting apples in both cases. Um, to get the apple to you, you get a, the store gets a whole bunch of apples in a big box. To get the applesauce to you, you get the applesauce in a cup that's covered with foil, that's in a package with eight other cups of applesauce. They come in a box to get to you after it's spent a lot of time in the factory, which uses energy to cut it, and wash it, and mash it, and mix it, and put it in the cup, and make the cup, and get it to you. So applesauce is great. I don't want you not to eat applesauce. But just think through the process of what does it take to give you 
is something in your life, and is it worth it to have it, or is it something you don't really need, or there's an alternative? I hear a lot of people, girls especially, interested in becoming vegetarians and thinking about that. How many of you are thinking about that? Okay. In addition to being healthier, um, it, one of the biggest carbon footprints uh, around is uh, the delivery of beef to you. So cutting back from beef, using chicken or fish is like a, a third what it takes to deliver meat to you. Going all the way back to vegetables is, is much less. So there are lots of things to think about when you become a vegetarian or stop eating beef. And one of them is it's a lot healthier for your planet in addition to you. Okay, so what about passenger vehicle fuel? How many of you have your driver's license? Well, huh? How many of you are probably going to get some kind of car in the next couple of years or already have gotten a car? Okay, so you guys have a lot of power. Now you're, now you're a consumer of something uh, where you have a lot of choice. There are hybrids out there, now they're coming to be electric cars. There are cars that use biofuels. So again, let's do some math. If you bought a car that got, say, 25 miles per gallon, or you could buy a car that got 35 miles per gallon. That's only 10 miles per gallon difference. But let's look at what that gives you. Let's say you live five miles from school, and, in what, and so you drive 10 miles a day, and there are 180 school days where you're driving up here. And so that's 1,800 miles that you're gonna drive. And if you get, um, your, your difference here is 10 miles per gallon, so you're and the difference between these two cars over a year is 180 gallons, and at $5 a gallon, that's $940, or 3,600 pounds of CO2. So the difference of only 10 miles per gallon in a car can make a huge difference to your pocketbook and to the amount of CO2 that's released. So again, you have the power to make that decision because you're now in the age where you're getting cars, right? Okay, the last piece to bring this down is renewables. Renewables means ways that we can get electricity other than burning fossil fuels. So if we had our whole country, our whole planet running off of renewables, that could run our factories, it could run our trucks, it could run our cars, we plug everything in, and everything is peachy. That would be great. To get that, it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of time. But already a lot of it's happening, especially out in our deserts. Um, solar farms are being put up. Maybe you've seen the wind farms on the way to Palm Springs. Every time you go out there, there are more and more windmills. And they're being put up in oceans. More and more companies are making electric cars. So we're getting closer and closer to that kind of ideal situation where we're not burning fossil fuels at all. Okay, another thing, this is population growth. Over time, population on our planet has increased to now we're past 7 billion. Um, in this country, women have a lot of choice in how many children they have. In other countries, a lot of other countries, women don't have so much choice. They're just, that's what they're going to do is have kids, they have a high death rate for births, so they have even more kids, they need the kids to work. Uh, they're going to be at home anyway because there's nothing else for them to do. And there are more and more and more kids. And I don't know that much about my stepdaughter. She does this about women's health all over the planet. And she tells me that the number one you can reduce the population of the planet is to educate the women. That's pretty cool. If you have educated women, they might go to school instead of starting having babies at age 15, and, uh, and life will end up being a lot better for them. And the, the other part of the story is, uh, in a lot of countries that are now developing and getting stronger and getting more resources, uh, families and homes are going from washing their clothes in the river, which is a pretty low 
carbon footprint to washing the clothes and washing machines, which takes a lot of energy to make that washing machine. So in addition to our planet getting more people, we're also getting more people that want more resources. Okay, so we looked at data. We looked at the Sea of Okugu. We looked at the melting ice. Um, mostly what I've showed you today is data. So where's the debate? Well, there's lots still to debate. We know this is happening, but what do we do about it in a big term, in, on the big scale? If we, if we stop buying stuff, that's going to change our whole economy. So that's a big question. How do we deal with that? Um, if we change from fossil fuels, what are all the oil companies and coal companies going to do? That's a big question. People come up to me and say, well, I understand this, I get it, but if I, if I stop buying all these water bottles, what are the people who work in the water bottle, water bottle factories going to do? And these are some problems where there is room for debate. How are you going to balance the environment with the economy? And I don't know the answer. This is for you guys to help figure out. Okay, so we've talked about things that you can do. That shower, don't forget that shower, five minute shower, changing your light bulbs, turning down your thermostat, thinking about fuel efficient cars, uh, thinking about a water bottle that you reuse. And I want to tell you about a couple of things that young people have done or are doing. Um, first of all, there's a kid named Alex Lures, who's from Sierra Madre, and he started talking, giving talks to schools about the climate when he was about 13 years old. And now he's almost 19, I think, and he's given like a thousand talks to schools. He's an amazing kid, and he started this website called Kids vs. Global Warming. I'll give you the website at the end. And there's this little part on it called I Matter, which is very, very clever. So I encourage you to look at what he's done. East Altadena Little League <clears throat> gave, gave every player a reusable water bottle. And actually, most of them started using them and brought them to games. So instead of after a game under the benches in the dugout being totally littered with water bottles, um, everybody took their water bottle home and brought it back the next time. High Point Academy, how many of you are from High Point Academy? Uh, a couple of years ago they started a wasteless living program where uh, kids are asked to sort their trash between compostable, recyclable, and real trash. And not only are they, were they asked to do it, but they went and, uh, and so they understand why they do it, they understand how to do it, and they actually do it. And uh, the parents don't quite get it, but the kids are really good. Girl Scouts, how many of you are Girl Scouts? A lot of you kind of snuck past, a lot of you snuck past these new journeys that they have, and some of you kind of roll your eyes at these new journeys. But there's one series called It's Your Planet, Love It, and, all the, and at all the different levels, uh, the projects that you do are related to understanding the environment, either the water or energy, or at the cadet level, there's a journey called breathe, or at the senior level, there's a journey called so what, where you uh, understand about eating, global hunger, and how what you eat matters to your to climate change. I was in Africa two summers ago visiting my stepdaughter, who's right here, and it was amazing how many young people from our country we randomly ran into who were over there teaching women, educating women. It was, it was impressive to see how many, how many people there were anyway over there and how many of them were actually there for the specific goal to educate women. So a lot is going on. Um, some of this kind of seems overwhelming. The facts are in that it's, it's really happening, what we do about it, plenty of debate, plenty of room for debate there, but also plenty of opportunity. And as, they, as the uh, flight director said in the Apollo 13 movie, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. These are, whoops, these are a couple websites for you. The first one is climatenasa.gov. That's NASA's website about climate, 
where you can see a lot of the graphs that I showed you along with explanations. So you can go there and find these, this information for yourself. The second one is the story of stuff, which I mentioned, which has a little online video about stuff and water bottles, things like that. Um, the third one is Alec Bloor's website, the, the young man who has been fighting global warming by educating kids for quite a few years. And the last one is my new website called Climate Moms because I think half your problem is your moms at home. You can, you can do a lot, but if mom's going to do it the other way, then that makes it really tough. And uh, please go on Google Earth and look at the Amazon course. Okay, thank you very much.